Hello again, guys. Welcome back to um, part two of meiosis. Now, during part two, we are going to look at firstly, the importance of meiosis. Why is meiosis important? Or why do we need meiosis to take place in our bodies? It's simple. You know, meiosis is really a very important process or type of cell division because it helps us to form what we call gametes or sex cells so that um, fertilization is able to take place so that there's gonna be a formation of offspring, okay? And then also it reduces the number of chromosomes by a half, hence it's called a reduction, a reduction division, meaning in other ways, it reduces the number from diploid to haploid. And then it also ensures that sex cells have the, have the number of chromosomes of other somatic cells, so that when fertilization occurs, the zygote formed has the correct number of chromosomes. So it balances the doubling effect of fertilization. So in simple terms, meiosis ensures that the organism that is going to be formed has got the correct number of chromosomes, especially as human beings, for instance, we're supposed to have 46 chromosomes. So what Moses does is that it makes them to be 23. So it means that the sperm cell will contain 23 and the ovum or the egg cell will also contain 23. So that when these two fuse during fertilization, we have the correct number of chromosomes, which is 46. And then there's crossing over that is introduced during meiosis, which also introduces genetic variation or genetic variety. And genetic variation, it actually helps the offspring that so that it becomes better adapted to a particular environment and so that it is able to, but to have a greater chance of survival in that environment. It has got particular traits that are going to enable to be able to survive. Okay? Yes. And then, guys, meiosis is not always a perfect process that occurs in our bodies. It might be, uh, it might fail, it might be a failure, you know? So it's not always a perfect process as I've stated. So there are certain mistakes that occur during the process of meiosis. And then this usually can happen during anaphase one and anaphase two. And what happens is that now there's failure during anaphase whereby now um, the chromosomes, they fail to separate. Either the homologous pair fails to separate or either the chromatids fail to separate, leading to having extra chromosomes or chromatids in the final cells that are formed. So that occurs due to a certain process whereby now there's failure of separation of chromatids or chromosomes. And that process is called non-disjunction. So it's very important for you to know it because in an exam, you are going to be examined on it. They're gonna assess you. They're gonna ask, or they're gonna tell you, give the definition of non-disjunction, or they're gonna give you a diagram where by now, they will tell you that this is the, uh, maybe the last phase of meiosis two and looking at the number of chromosomes in a cell, what can you conclude? Or what condition uh, that you can say this person has, then that's when you're gonna talk about Down syndrome or trisomy 21, why? Because of non-disjunction. So, so if there's non-disjunction you know, of chromosome pair 21, specifically 21 in humans, it leads to the formation of abnormal gametes which will have an extra copy of chromosome 21, meaning chromosome 21 is gonna be extra. There's gonna be extra of it due to non disjunction. And if 
there's a fusion between a normal a gamete and abnormal gamete, which has an extra copy of, a, uh, of chromosome 21. It can lead to what we call Down syndrome or Tyson 21. So now Down syndrome is actually a genetic disorder that can happen due to failure during meiosis because of non disjunction. So what happens here, as you can see in the diagram, in this example that I'm giving you of Down syndrome, we are going to be talking about anaphase one specifically. Now, during anaphase one, what happens now, there's a failure of the separation of the homologous pairs. Because now, you know, during anaphase, um, each chromosome has to move to opposite poles. Okay, but now here, there's failure there. It doesn't occur. They do not separate. The homologous pair stays together. And then now the cell during telophase, it divides. And then as you can see, one cell will have 24 chromosomes in case of human beings. Yes, not all animal, not all animals, but in case of human beings. So we're gonna have 24 and the other cell will have 23. And then now what happens is that now, let's say it's the sperm cell that has got 24. So when the sperm cell, because now it's an abnormal gamete, it's going to fuse with an egg, which is normal. Therefore, meaning that the zygote that is going to result is going to have 47 chromosomes instead of 46. So that is what we call an abnormality. And that is what we call Down syndrome or trisomy 21. And remember, it's called trisomy 21 because it's non-disjunction that occurs on chromosome 21, whereby now there's going to be an extra uh, copy of chromosome 21. And then something also can happen, but it's rare in human beings. It occurs mostly in plants, what we call polyploid. What is polyploid? Polyploid refers to a condition in which the diploid will acquire additional sets of chromosomes. Okay, now polyploidy is less common in mammals than in plants. Okay, it's, it's, it, it occurs mostly in plants. And polyploidy in plants, especially when it comes to food, the plants that we eat is really a good thing because what happens is that now, once a plant has an extra or additional sets of chromosomes, it becomes bigger in size, as you can see here. The flower here, small, but this one is big due to polyploidy, due to the fact that it has acquired an additional chromosome, set, sets of chromosomes. They can be three. Once they are three, they're called triploidy. Once they are four, tetraploidy, just like here. They've got this one, two, three, four, tetraploidy. But that's not important. And then, as you can see here, this leaf is big. It's smaller than this. Because of polyploid, this one is bigger than this, which is a good thing. Just imagine if this one's a fruit, maybe a strawberry, you know, or maybe a watermelon. Because of polyploid, it becomes large in size, and then we're able to share to many people. So polyploid, it's something that has been adopted by farmers. Yes, people who are farming crops, yes, they have actually adopted this strategy um to make sure that they produce large uh crops you know so they can be able to supply to 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 the sellers like your shop right and so forth so that they can be able to distribute to many people in that way they gain profits but not not just profits they are also trying to curb or stop what we call um food insecurity so polyploid it's good when it happens in plants especially those plants that we eat. And then we're also going to compare these two divisions, mitosis and meiosis, because in an exam, you can also be, be asked to, to compare the two, give the differences or the similarities, but there are more differences than similarities. So as you remember, mitosis actually that's when the cell divides only once, meaning the division is with only one 
division. But for meiosis, we've got two divisions, meiosis one and two. So the cell has to divide twice. And then two genetically identical, so the two genetically identical cells are produced during mitosis, but four genetically identical cells are formed during meiosis. And then mitosis occurs in body cells or somatic cells, but meiosis occurs in sex cells or gametes, simple. And then during mitosis, homologous chromosomes are not arranged in pets during prophase. Remember, we talked about that on our previous video, part one. And then during meiosis, the homologous chromosomes are arranged in pairs during anaphase one. And then no crossing over during prophase takes place during mitosis, but there is prophase in meiosis. And then chromosomes in mitosis are arranged in individually, they are arranged individually along the equator during metaphase. But during meiosis, they are arranged in pairs along the equator during metaphase one. And then chromatids are, are pulled apart during anaphase uh, in case of mitosis, but during meiosis, chromosomes are pulled apart during anaphase one. Now, let us just look at the similar similarities first. Now, what's similar here um, is that now, at the end of the day, there's going to be new cells that are produced in both uh, cell divisions. And the cell cycle all includes interphase and cytokinases, okay? As I've stated to you that, you know, interphase occurs between these two. Uh, division so it's that's what makes them to be similar because they have to go through interface before they start occurring and in both cells the cytokinase is occurring meaning there's going to be the division of the cytoplasm when the cell membrane starts to constrict and so forth and then they have got similar basic steps as i've stated they've got prophase metaphase anaphase and telophase and what i'd like to add is that now the anaphase uh, of mitosis is similar to anaphase of meiosis, explicitly anaphase, mainly for anaphase um, two because the separation of the chromatids. Yeah, that's it for similarities. You don't have to know a lot of them. You will be ask, uh, asked mostly about the differences. Now, I want us to look at something very important as well because you might be asked about it, just like the other things I've stated that you might be asked about, and then you can also be asked about a uh, karyotype. It's very important to understand the karyotype. Now, what is a karyotype? It is a photograph that shows chromosomes of an individual arranged from the largest chromosomes to the smallest chromosomes. As you can see here, you've got two karyotypes, the one for male and the one for female. Now, you can see here, these are large, these are medium, small, smallest. Now, what is important that you need to know here is that we have got 23 pairs of chromosomes in each karyotype. We've got one until 22. This is the 23rd one, but they did not say 23 because it's so special. I'll explain why. But you need to understand that this chromosome is from mother, this is from the father, and so forth. Now, this one, these are what we call sex chromosomes. Sex chromosomes, they are important for you to know. For males, we have got X and Y sex chromosomes. And then for females, we've got X and X chromosomes. So when these, X combines with an X here, the child is going to be what? Going to be female because of XX. That's how you determine a karyotype. This one is for a male because of his, there's X and Y chromosome. This one is for a female because of X and X. So if X and X combine, they form a male, a female, sorry. But if X and Y, they combine, they form a male, as simple as that. And also I want us to look at the karyotype shaving down syndrome. As you can see here, we've got all the chromosomes up until the 23rd. Now, what I forgot is that 
all 22 chromosomes here from one to 22, they are what we call um, autosomes. These 22 pairs are called autosomes, you know, and they have different characteristics. They have characteristics for eye color, for hair color, for height and so forth. But this one, the 23rd is what we call the sex chromosomes and they only contain or they only represent biological sex. They code for biological sex, those ones. Yeah, and then when you look at the karyotype of someone with Down syndrome, you'll see that there's an extra chromosome here, chromosome 21. We've got, you see, an extra one. So that is what we, lead to, uh, what we call Down syndrome. That's how we see it uh, on the karyotype. Thank you guys for your attention. Thank you for the support. Goodbye. Oh.